All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar of 2018. Um, we're excited to kind of talk pretty much anything and all things ultrasound uh, today. Doug Wagen is going to be talking about um, using ultrasound for condition monitoring and and kind of all the different options and ways you can do that and utilize ultrasound um, for pretty much you know any plant and all budgets um, and kind of talk you through all those different options um, and how ultrasound you know can be used for all the different applications as well. So it should be pretty pretty interesting for those of you who aren't familiar with ultrasound um, should should definitely give you a good taste of what it can do um, and then a, for those of you who are familiar or even using ultrasound it could you know hopefully help you see what what else there is and, and how you can go to that next level with your program. So hopefully everybody will enjoy what we've got uh, planned for you today. Uh, before I turn things over to Doug, just a couple housekeeping things. Um, we are recording this session, so we'll put this up on our website um, later on this afternoon. So if you have to hop off early or, or someone um, that you wanted to hear this wasn't able to join, you know, they'll be able to take advantage of that recording after the fact. Um, and of course, we always welcome questions. So uh, feel free to type those in. I'll be monitoring those throughout the session. Um, and I'll, you know, toss those to Doug as it as it uh, makes sense. And of course, we'll have some time at the end as well for some Q&A. Um, so we'll try and make this as interactive as we as we can with all of us being spread out throughout the country uh, and globe. We've got quite a few international folks joining us today as well. So that's really cool. Um, I always like to also mention, you know, we are doing this live, so just bear with us if we run into any internet issues or audio issues, we'll we'll try and get those things resolved as quickly as we can. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind. We're trying to trying to do this thing uh, live and make it, you know, able to be interactive. So um, that sometimes can lead to issues. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, so without further ado, I am going to turn the screen over here to Doug and let him take things away. All right, thank you, Maureen. Uh, welcome, good afternoon, everyone. I am gonna put my screen in slideshow mode here. Perfect. If you could looks, just give me a heads great. up that you can see my screen. Yep, looks good. Then we're in good shape. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hope everybody is having a great Wednesday afternoon, as as we are here at UE. Um, today, we're going to spend uh, probably the next 45, 50 minutes or so talking about condition monitoring using ultrasound technology. Um, we've got a, a lot of different options that, that we use for monitoring our, our assets, and I'm going to go through some of them. Um, like Maureen said, please feel free to type in questions at the end of the presentation. We'll certainly have some time to answer some questions live for you guys. Um, but, you know, we've got a bunch of different options that we use to monitor the condition of our assets. One of them, as you can see on the, on the top left here, is our digital handheld ultrasonic instruments, where we essentially take high-frequency sound, translated into something we can hear audibly through a headphone or through a speaker. But these units have really evolved over time, so we can do a lot more with them. We can measure the decibel levels. We can trend and chart those decibel levels. We, we can take that information and look at different alarm levels that can tell us to take certain actions. At the same time, we can also record sounds of these various uh, assets, and we can turn around and run those recorded sounds uh, either through the instrument itself and look at what a spectrum looks like on the screen on some of the instruments. And with some of the instruments, we can transfer that information to our computer and view either FFT or time waveform data uh, right on our screen and do some, some analysis of what we're hearing. So that's one, one method and one way we, we go out and we monitor the condition of our, of our assets. Another is, is remote condition monitoring. Um, where we don't necessarily want to have to go out and test an individual point, we can mount remote sensing 
on those points. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about a couple different options for that, um, like our Ultra Trek 750 seen here. Uh, we're also going to highlight a new product. Some of you may have seen this already. Uh, some this will be a, an introduction, but it's called the UE Forecast System. It's our 24-7 monitoring system where we can essentially hook sensors up to an asset, uh, run those uh, cables back into a uh, small box, which is our forecast box. And this is an ethernet enabled box that we run through the plant's ethernet and we can control uh, our data acquisition via uh, a remote location or via our laptop or really however we wanna do it. Also, there's, there's methods to do that in a wireless form. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about our switch box, which is used with our handheld instruments and allows you just from a, a time saving standpoint to go out and plug in once uh, where you can mount this switch box in a safe area, uh, safe, easy to access area, and you can monitor eight points uh, one at a time with our handheld units. So we'll cover a, a lot of ground today. As I said, please feel free to, to type in questions as we go through this. Um, just a little bit of quick background about UE Systems. Uh, been around for about 45 years. Um, obviously, uh, over that period of time, we've developed a lot of different products, uh, both handheld and permanently mounted products. Um, and, and a lot of things have changed. I mean, the game has really changed over the last couple of years. Um, and, and the handheld ultra probes, you know, what they're able to do, the functionality has just improved year after year after year. I mean, they've become much more user friendly. Some of our instruments even have touchscreen technology, uh, similar to an Android or iPhone. Um, a lot easier data transfer than ever in the past. We use SD cards now to, to get our information from our handheld instruments into our, into our software. So it makes it very easy to get both uh, data and sound files back back and forth actually when we develop routes we can load those up into our handheld instruments and we can download those back into our computer program so that's made uh, made things much easier and much more user friendly over the years a um, lot more increased processor capacity these instruments can store a lot more information again because we're using those sd cards and probably one of the biggest game changers with our our handheld equipment has been the the advent of a lot better batteries that are available so we've got a, a vastly improved battery power. Uh, you can typically go out um, and get at least four hours of, of data collection done. And then simply by most of the instruments have a quick change battery that lets you do, you know, another four hours. So the, the increase in the battery power has been a big uh big improvement in these handheld units over the years. Um, also, our permanent sensors and systems are, are really advancing. Uh, some of that's advancements in the technology itself. I mean, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, most plants now have, you know, ethernet networks throughout the plant, which makes data movement real easy from point A to point B. Uh, and a big part of the reason that this is all changing is because of you folks that are out there is because our end user needs have really started to change and as a company we really uh we really focus on listening you know while i'm going to be talking for the next hour but typically we focus on listening we want to hear what people need and you know what we've been hearing and the catalyst and what's been driving a lot of the advancements in the technology um has been has been that has been the fact that if I can get my slide to change here, sorry about that. Hold on a second. Oh, there we go. Um, is the fact that those end, end user needs have been evolving and changing. And, and one of the things that, that comes right to the top is the safety requirements that, that tend to be limiting access um, to our techs that are trying to go out there and take readings in your plants. Um, you know, a lot more shielding, a lot more guarding uh, to keep people out of rotating equipment has, has really been the catalyst for us working very hard to come up with solutions to those, to those uh, stumbling blocks. Um, the other thing is limited manpower. 
So we've got to, you know, come up with products that let you do a lot more efficient data collection, you know, take more readings in less time, essentially, um, because we don't have as many trained, you know, personnel out there to do the data collection. Still, we need the consistency of the data. Um, so these systems need to be a lot smarter. You know, they have to be a lot less dependent on that tribal knowledge or on those specialized skill sets. You know, the data needs to be able to be interpreted, but we can't always rely on, on you know, the human data interpretation. And as we go through this, uh, I'll show you some of the things that, that we've done to change that. So it's not so reliant on a person making that decision. You know, we've got a lot of industry standards out there, uh, a lot of companies that have tremendous amount of experience with analyzing the data. And, and that's where we've been driving both our handheld instruments and our, our permanent sensors so that it's not as reliant on a, on a person's interpretation. So really, we look at it like there's three ways to monitor the condition of any of your assets. Um, one is is what I call traditional, you know, data collection with a handheld instrument, Ultra Probe 15,000, Ultra Probe 10,000. You know, go out, set up a route, you know, and decide on a, a data collection interval, you know, whether it's monthly, quarterly, you know, obviously depending on the criticality of the asset and, and having a tech go out and physically, you know, make contact with, with that asset and take those readings, store the data, store the sound files, and then look at that data in a, in a software package and then make appropriate decisions based on what that data tells us. Um, so that's still a, a, a viable way to test a lot of your assets is with a person doing handheld data collection. You know, another way to do it is continuous monitoring you know, with permanent sensing technology where it is now, a lot of the things that we can do with our handheld instruments, actually everything we can do with a handheld instrument, we can now do by permanently affixing a sensor onto your asset. And as long as we have access to that sensor uh, via wireless, via ethernet connection, you know, we're able to go out and we're able to get very good data and sound files on that. And then the third, way to monitor the condition of the assets is a combination, you know, doing both. I think the permanent sensor technology is great, but there's still definitely a place uh, to go out and do handheld data collection. So as we go through today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, you know, these three, these three ways of monitoring and taking a look at, you know, what's going on in our plants. So handheld data collection, the Ultra Probe series of instruments, as I mentioned early, earlier, they really evolved. Um, the 15,000, uh, which is our, our full sort of full feature reliability instrument, you know, onboard sound recording, digital camera, temperature sensing, uh, onboard spectrum analysis. It can do darn near everything when it comes to, to an analyzing one of your assets. The 10,000 can do many of the same things as the 15. Uh, no onboard camera, but uh, about all the same things that we can do with the 15, we can get to with the 10. One of the other areas that's become huge in ultrasonic testing is ultrasonic condition monitoring uh, and condition-based lubrication. So the 401 Grease Caddy, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Grease Caddy, it's a digital device that mounts on a grease gun and allows us to make sure we're not putting too much grease in. It also allows us to track uh, the amount of grease that's actually put in versus the planned amount. Uh, if you're currently doing a, doing a time-based program and you're looking to transition into a condition-based program, the grease caddy is really a good, good way to do that. Um, and then we've got our, our RAS, which is our remote access sensor and our remote access sensor, which is magnetic, the MT, magnetic transducer, uh, which are used with those handheld units to get into tough to reach areas, or in the case of the, the RAS, we can actually permanently mount those and come out and take readings from a safe, you know, clean, easy to access area, rather than trying to get behind guards and shields. So really the handheld is um, in, our, in our digital instruments, there's a solution for just about every access problem. So a typical asset, 
we'll use as an example just for our purposes of discussion here. Let's look at a, a motor pump combination. Now, we've got a lot of ways we can go monitor this. One, we could take our ultra probe out with a contact probe and we could actually touch four points on that, that motor and that pump. Outboard, inboard, inboard, outboard. And we could just follow the, the powertrain on that and we could take readings, store them, store sound files, bring them back via this SD card and take them right into our software suite. Easy enough to do. Our other option, if there's access or guards or shields around this motor and pump and they're tough to get to, or it's an air handler up on a roof, or it's something that's in an environment that isn't exactly uh, safe or clean to access for our, for our tech, we could mount remote access sensors here. Then we bring those remote access sensors back anywhere from three feet to 100 feet away from the asset, and we could still take our handheld data collector out, and we could still take readings and record sounds on that. So that, that's one way to do it. We would take the information via that SD card, take it right into our computer, and then we're able to take that data. We're able to organize it. In other words, you can take a look here at the DMS-6 software, which has our, our data tree, and we can look at individual data points. We're able to trend that information over time. So we can create nice trend charts with our baselines, our low alarm and high alarm levels. We can also take the sound files recorded on this SD card. We can run it through our FFT analysis software, our spectralizer software, and look at it from an FFT perspective, or we can even look at a time waveform. So from a, a handheld data collection standpoint, you know, many of the assets that you have in your facility are, are certainly now accessible and easy enough for us to test with the handheld unit. The ones that aren't, we can go out, we can mount RAS sensors on there, and we can, we can solve those access issues. But it still requires a person to go out and take the readings, whether that be monthly, weekly, quarterly, however you decide based on the criticality of the asset. So let's talk a little bit now about continuous monitoring. We'll move away from, from some of the handheld. We'll talk about looking at the asset you know, all the time. We've got a lot of different sensor options. The first one I'll talk about is our UltraTrack 750. Uh, it's an analog sensor. Essentially, you give this sensor power and then you monitor what the sensor draws against that power loop. Uh, very typical configuration for this is a, a 4 to 20 milliamp uh, power, closed loop power loop for the, uh, the UltraTrack 750. Um, plug that into a PLC and you can essentially correlate the, the milliamps it's drawing to a dB level, okay? A very simple, almost a yes or no type of a, an analog sensor. So that's certainly one option. Uh, we've got our, our 586, similar to the 750. Uh, the big difference here you might notice is the 750 is a self-contained sensor. All the electronics are inside of the 750. The 586 uses a RAS sensor and then the electronics are housed in this little box. Uh, box is probably the size of uh, two packs of playing cards. You can mount that up to 100 feet away from the assets. And really where this might be used instead of a 750 is in a, a bad environment. In other words, if you've got very high both surface and ambient temperatures, um, you may want to remove the electronics from that that unpleasant environment and put the electronics, you know, 100 feet away and just have the sensor in that environment. Again, an analog, um, either a, a 0 to 10 volt or a 4 to 20 milliamp output, um, just the front end really requires a PLC to, to analyze or to do anything with the data that it's, that it's acquiring. The next thing we have is our, our RAS sensors. Now the RAS sensor comes in a couple different configurations. Uh, one is a, a magnetic RAS sensor seen here. That plugs directly into one of your handheld data collectors, either an UltraProbe 10, 15, a 9. One of those instruments, you plug this into the front, and now you've got a, a magnetic pickup that you can go out and get a nice consistent reading uh, and a sound file on. The other configuration for the RAS is 
non-magnetic. It requires uh, either a drill and tap or most commonly in a, a stud that we epoxy onto the asset. And then we can thread that RAS sensor on and permanently affix it, run that cable back any number of lengths up to you know 100 feet or more away from the asset. And we can use that RAS with our handheld instruments, we can go up and touch it. We can use that RAS with uh, an eight channel switch box, or we can use that RAS sensor with our ethernet enabled 24 seven forecast monitoring system. Now the forecast will take a four channel input. So we can actually take that same motor pump combination we were talking about earlier, and we could monitor that with this forecast system. Now the forecast lets us do essentially three things. We can program it via our computer to go out and take readings on a timed basis. In other words, go out once a day, once a week, once a month and store a reading. Um, when that reading hits an alarm level, that forecast system is gonna send that data across to our DMS software. And the third way we use it is we can log into it remotely and we can take a reading now. It's listening 24 seven, but it's very uh, user defined as far as how we set it up to acquire data, how to send data when it's an alarm and whether or not we wanna go in and look at what's going on with that particular asset today. So that's sort of the latest and greatest of our online monitoring. And I'll spend some more time on that a little bit later and go through some details with you folks. And lastly, we've got our electric cabinet monitor. Um, different from these other sensors in the sense that it's the only airborne permanent monitor really used to mount inside of your electrical switch gear and continuously monitor for a, a corona tracking or arcing condition, mostly tracking or arcing, and alert you again via, similar to the, the 586, via an output. Okay, so that's really what we have, you know, currently from a, a permanent continuous monitoring uh, standpoint. We'll talk just a little bit more now about the 750 sensor. Uh, stainless steel housing, all kinds of cable lengths available. Real simple to install uh, on our assets. We use this, what's called a click bond mounting system where we mount the stud. Surface needs to be fairly clean, free of you know crud and dirt and, and excess paint. But once you've got a fairly clean surface, real easy to mount these. You mix up an epoxy kit, uh, you put it on, push down the plastic cover, wait 15 or minutes or so for that for that epoxy to clear uh, cure and then we we snap off the plastic mounting kit from the stud and we've got a nice permanent mount to mount either our 750s or our RAS sensors on this seems to work really well we've gotten really positive feedback over the past 10 years using this click bond system uh, it actually it actually will hold those sensors on there extremely well one side note on this that I'll mention. Uh, for those of you who may already have some of these studs in your facilities, each time you get a RAS or a 750, it comes with one of these. Uh, that epoxy has a shelf life. So you need to refrigerate that. You can probably get uh, six months or a year out of it. But if you don't refrigerate it, you're not going to get much time. Uh, you might get two months out of it for that epoxy before it's no longer going to have the same adhesive qualities. So keep that in the back of your mind. Little bit about the 750. Um, I've got a wiring diagram here of uh, one of the typical ways that that gets wired up, um, which is a four to 20 milliamp loop powered. Um, so basically you, you power up the sensor, you mount it using one of those click bond mounting systems and you monitor what that sensor is drawing against the power supply. So if it's drawing four milliamps, eh, it's about, zero dB, it's it's really no sound. Uh, five is two and a half and so on and so forth. We can correlate what that draws to a dB level. So if we're in our, in our PLC, we can actually set it up to alarm. Uh, once it draws three milliamp difference, 
Okay, so it's not necessarily three milliamps. It's a three milliamp difference, a change in three milliamps. Um, that's approximately an eight decibel rise. And that's our low alarm level that we use with all of our handheld units and with, with the forecast system. About a 60 or a six milliamp rise is closer to our high alarm level, 16 dB. So the 750 can be used to give some simple information back on rotating equipment. It can also be used, think about a, a pressure relief valve where you want to mount that sensor there. And if that valve is closed, it's always going to be drawn 4 milliamp. It's, there's no sound. Soon as that pressure relief valve pops open, all of a sudden that sensor is probably going to be drawn the max. It's probably going to be drawn 20. So it's an instant notification that there's a, that there's a problem. Again, that's there's other ways to wire this up. Uh, you can do it with an output. It has adjustable sensitivity, but this this loop powered is is probably the most common use of the the UltraTrack 750. Again, a simple analog sensor. So let's move on. Let's let's talk a little bit about our RAS sensors and our switch box. Seen here, you can see we can mount eight of those RAS sensors up to this switch box, and then we can simply go up with one of our handheld devices uh, and and put this BNC connection on, and then click through eight different individual points. Gives us all the functionality of using a handheld as if we were were touching it but without the excessive time it takes to go out and touch eight points or to use you know eight different BNC connections one at a time. It, so from a, a data acquisition standpoint, we're, we're thinking this is gonna be a huge time saver. It's already proven in a lot of plants to, to be able to cut down you know, the data acquisition on some large routes you know, by exponentially because you can get eight points in the same time it would take you to take one reading. Um, so your RAS sensor attaches, here's a picture of it. Uh, you can see that's where the stud mount is. Um, that, that stud mounting kit, that click bond kit's included with each one of the sensors. So we simply connect it to a BNC and we, we run that cable back to, uh, to a switch box or to an ultra probe. Uh, these cables, all different kinds of lengths, we'll go through that here in, in just a little bit. Another picture of a close-up of the switch box, you can see one through eight. Obviously, data acquisition made really simple by just clicking through those, clicking through those points, taking decibel levels, but also being able to record sound files from one, one point where you have this box mounted in a, in a clean, safe, you know, easy to access environment. Again, here's a picture of a handheld unit with the BNC connection just on the, the remote access module or RAM module. If you run into some issues with temperature, I uh, thought I would just throw this slide up here. This is a thermal isolation device. So if you, if you do have real high surface temperatures, both the RAS and the 750 do have some limitations, probably 160 to 165 degrees F. Um, you don't really want to go much higher than that. Uh, by putting this thermal isolation device on, essentially it's an air radiator. One end, you drill and tap a, a stud onto the, the asset. The other end, you would, you would thread on your RAS or your 750. Once this is installed, as long as ambient temperature is cooler, because it's using these fins to, to radiate the temperature, you can get up to 600 degrees F surface temperature by using this. So it's a, it's a good solution to... Uh, to the high surface temperature assets that you might have. So let's move on and talk a little bit about our new forecast system. Um, again, I'm gonna use a motor pump as a, an example of an asset. And essentially we can mount four of our RAS sensors up to that motor and pump. Just like we talked about earlier, where you could come up with one of our handheld data collectors and you could do, you know, monthly routes and you could 
plug into a switch box or you could plug into these RAS sensors and take readings and sound recordings and, and monitor the condition of this asset. I can do the same thing with our forecast system. I mean, I can do handheld data collection, only I don't need the hand. This plugs straight into the box. This can be mounted, you know, 100 feet or more away from the asset. Uh, this box is about mm, two inches by four by five. I'm roughing that in, but uh, a small, you know, compact box. Up here, we've got an Ethernet connection. So you basically plug this into an Ethernet port, and that information then can be transferred over to our desktop or our laptop, wherever we have the, the software, our DMS6 software and the forecast server residing. We can transfer that data. And, and this forecast will, will do essentially three things. It'll let us get our data three ways. One, we can log in here and we can go see what's going on with all four of those points right now. We can listen to them real time. We can get WAV files real time. We can take data real time on what's happening. This box is, is never off. It's listening 24 seven. The other thing we can do is we can program the box to go out once a minute, once an hour, once a day, once a week, once a month, however often we want it to and store any one of these readings store the decibels, store the wave files. The other thing we can do, and the forecast sort of does this on its own, once we set up alarm levels, it will change its data acquisition rate upon alarm. It'll go back and grab readings previous to the alarm, however many we tell it to, during the alarm and after the alarm. It'll do the same thing with wave files and then it'll automatically transfer that information over to our software package. It'll also notify us if there's a, if there's a, a point in alarm. In other words, via an email, a text, it'll tell us we've got a problem. Okay, so the forecast really does all the data acquisition tasks that a person would do with one of our handheld instruments, only you don't need the person other than to, to manage the laptop and the software and the data. No reason you can't do this in a wireless form. You could simply just mount a wireless router here on the forecast system, mount a wireless router on the computer, and you transfer the data that way. It's not streaming. It's not constantly streaming data. So you're not tying up a lot of your ethernet bandwidth. Um, it, it's basically, as I mentioned, sending that data over upon alarms or it's allowing us to go in and get the data uh, whenever we want but it's sort of like the video camera in a convenience store it's always watching 24 7 so once the place is robbed you can go back and review the tape so to speak and see what happened leading up to that robbery you see the two guys casing the joint you see the guy pull his gun out you see him rob it, and then you see what kind of getaway car he got in after he left. So it's the video camera, but it's using sound instead. Once that data is sent to the computer, or once we go get it, we then can take that data and we can look at it in a historical format in our DMS6 software where we see individual points, we see trends on those points, we can track it and trend it over time. So we can look at that individual point over a certain number of days, months, hours. We can see based on a baseline, we can see our low alarm, our high alarm level. And just like the data we would get from our handheld unit, we can run it through our spectrum analysis software and look at the FFT, tell us if it does reach an alarm, uh, what does that alarm mean? What's the significance of it? Do I have an inner race defect, an outer race defect? What exactly is, is my problem there? And I can also run it into a time waveform. Let's say I've hooked some of these points instead of up to a rotating asset. Let's say I've got these points hooked up to valves. And I want to see if those valves open and close. And I want to document that. I can do that in my time waveform software. So that's the, the basic forecast setup, the system, how it works. I'm going to get a little more into that in, in just a second. Here's a close-up of the box itself, stainless steel housing, uh, four BNC connections. 
There's a RAS sensor. You can see these simply hook on the asset and the cables hook up to the, to the forecast system. So what's the components of this system? RAS sensors, cables. We have three to 100 foot standard length cables available. No reason you couldn't go longer than that. Um, there's the forecast box. You do need a, an ethernet network. Unless you plan to use a, a wireless router, you need an ethernet for the data transfer. These three items here, the SQL database that it uses to keep, the, keep track of the data, this forecast server, which, which lets us set up and do our data acquisition, set our alarm levels, and the, the DMS program, which is our user interface software, all three of these you download when you download the DMS program. Okay, so it's essentially just three software programs. Little on the hardware, stainless steel housing, four sensor input, uh, again, has an ethernet connection. It has a power supply port on it, uh, where we can supply a power supply, optional. Uh, just depends if you have clean, reliable power. Um, onboard storage, this is really the, the key to this system. Um, I think one of the, the exciting things about the forecast system is that we can store a tremendous amount of data on board. We're not tying up a lot of bandwidth on your ethernet um, to stream data over. We don't wanna see that that bearing stayed at 20 dB and we tested it every day for a month. We don't, we don't need a reading every day. What we're really looking for is what changed. You know, did it change, you know, from 20 dB to 28 dB and entered a low alarm level. So the fact that we can store all that on board and tell the forecast when to send it over, or we can go grab it if we need it, I think is really powerful about, about this, uh, this new system. Uh, it has a lithium battery, of course, like your cell phone, so it's gonna remember your settings even if you lose power. The sensors themselves, just the RAS sensors, same sensor you use with uh, with our handheld tools. If you're if you're doing that can already, um, the the nice thing about it is it's real easy to expand your ultrasound program when you, when you've got RAS sensors hooked up and you're taking monthly readings doing handheld data acquisition. There's no reason you can't just take four of those that are already installed plug them right into a forecast and start monitoring you know monitoring them remotely without the need to go take readings so that's that's sort of a powerful thing about using these existing ras sensors all kinds of cable lengths mounting kits water ingress is pretty good on this box it's ip65 it'll it'll survive washdowns it'll survive some pretty aggressive cleanups you may want to think about some shrink wrap over these bnc connections just to keep the water off of those if they are exposed to to washdowns. Got high temperature RAS sensors, cables to go with them, some heavy duty RASs. So there's a lot of, a lot of flexibility we have with these sensors and, and a lot of different ways that, that we can help you pretty much in, in every situation, every circumstance where you may want to do remote monitoring. So your network needs to be ready to be able to, to get this thing wired up and, and to start using it. Um, you do need an IP address for inside the network. That IP address is for the computer where you're gonna host the server and the SQL database and all that. So usually that's pretty easy. Um, go to your IT people, get a, it's no different than a network printer. You just need a, you need an IP address. Then you open this box, the forecast box, and there's a spin and click dial in there. And you can simply spin and click in that IP address into the forecast. Once you do that, the forecast becomes discoverable. It can talk to the computer that's hosting the server. Then the computer is gonna go ahead and assign that forecast its own IP address. It's as simple as that. Um, Here's a setup, just an example of a setup. Computer has uh, DMS6 on it, has the software, has the forecast server running. There's the IP address. We're able to log into this computer and basically ascertain the condition of this asset based on those four points. Okay, it's, it's as simple as that. We can do the same thing remotely. Uh, from multiple computers inside of an individual facility. As long as we have access to this computer, 
as long as we know the IP address for this computer where the server is, we can then log in. As long as we have DMS installed on these computers, we can log in here and we can go see what, what the condition of that asset is. No reason we can't do it wireless on either side of this picture here. Um, you simply need a, a wireless router on the forecast, wireless router on the computer where the server's hosted, and boom, they're talking, they're communicating. You can pull all the data you want. If it hits alarm, it's gonna send data over. And if you've got remote sites, uh, if you're home, if you're in a different country and you wanna monitor this asset, as long as you have access past the firewall here, into that computer where the server is, you can go and look at all the available forecasts. No different than just having a, a system, you know, hardwired, really, as long as there's access past the firewall and you can get into this computer. So that's sort of how the system works. Um, a little bit on our, our software um, and how we, how we manage this data. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with our ultrasonic units and you've used DMS software in the past, there's only one thing different. It's got a forecast tab on it now. So you can go click that forecast tab and you're gonna open up some other options. Need to set up a database. Um, there's a wizard inside of DMS that lets you go through and set up your database. You know, your, your plant, your application, your group, and then your individual assets, motors, pumps, whatever they may be, and those individual points on those motors and pumps. And then, of course, underneath each of these, there'll be a, a history. In other words, point one will have monthly readings, you know, daily readings, however often you choose to go out and, and get that data. So this is how we would set up a, a database for our handheld units no different than how we set it up for the forecast. As a matter of fact, if you've got an existing database that you're going and taking readings with your handheld ultrasonic units, you can just switch that. You can go and pick out which of those points you want to monitor by, by simply unplugging the RAS sensor and plugging it into the forecast. Okay, here's what the screen looks like when we do go into a our forecast. We've got several other tabs that open up that let us do things like change the amount of days we keep readings on board the forecast box before we send them over to uh, before we send them over to our DMS software for a permanent record. Again, here's what I mentioned about the database. Once you've got a router, a database set up made it real easy to go in here to forecast points, set up those individual points by just using these pull down menus. So we can pick which plant we wanna use, which bearing, which group, and which individual motor. And then on that motor or that asset combination, we can set up individual points. We can go in, we can get a reading now, we can get a reading with a wave file now, or we could just set it up on a timed basis to go take readings based on, on how critical that asset is and how often we wanna see the information. Here's where we program in to the forecast, how many days or how often we wanna store a reading. This can be anything from every hour to every day. Um, here's the, the interval where we're gonna send it over for a permanent record to DMS where it actually leaves the box and we send it over and keep it somewhere else. Um, and here's where the real power of this forecast system is. It's setting up how many readings you wanna see before something went into alarm, how many readings you wanna see while it was in alarm, and how many readings you wanna see after it's left alarm, if it leaves, leaves alarm. Um, and I can go through and apply this to each, each point individually. Maybe I have different data acquisition needs on the motor than I do on the pump or vice versa, or I can just apply this to all. So it's very easy, it's very user defined as far as how often you take readings um, and when you take readings, you know what you do with that information. Just like with our decibels, we have the ability to customize how often we record a sound wave, how often we send that sound wave over for a permanent record in our DMS, and we have the ability to put, you know, the wave storage interval 
when it hits alarm. In other words, we may be recording a sound wave once a week or once a month, and then when it hits alarm, we're going to switch that schedule and we're going to start taking a sound file every hour, every day. Okay, so we can have that, that information we can use when we go in and do our root cause analysis of that failure. Okay, the only other thing we need to set up with WAV files, obviously, is how long the WAV file needs to be. We probably will set it up to have a certain length of sound file when it's not an alarm, and you certainly have the option to set up a different sound file length when it's in alarm. You may want more information when, a, when an asset enters alarm. Screenshot, here's what sort of the dashboard looks like. We've got a couple things it shows us here. It's got our signal level, no different than the handhelds on the back of the instrument that have the LEDs that go up and down. This just shows us each sensor and what kind of signal level we have on it. Uh, here's our alarm state. If this was an alarm, it turns red. Here's our alarm levels. And there's what our sensor is reading in decibels. So you can see from a dashboard standpoint, here's a little better shot of it um, where we capture a DB reading sound file. Um, in this case, this is hit an alarm level. You can see we had it set up to alarm at 14 DB. It hit 20. It shows red, but it, then it also starts storing both, both data and sound files at the new rate, at the alarm rate based on, on whoever the user is and how, how they customize it. Very similar to anybody who's used our, our DMS in the past, you can see our alarms are gonna show up in red. There's all our historical data. If there's a wave file attached, it's gonna have that icon. We can monitor over time, we can track it and trend it using our, our our charting feature inside of DMS. See here, we've got our baseline in green. There's our low alarm or 8 dB over a baseline, and there's our high alarm level in red. If we have a, a particular historical record that goes into alarm and we've recorded a wave file, we can tell by this icon there's a wave file attached down here, hit open, and we're able to go in then and analyze you know, based on what we're seeing, based on the harmonics we're seeing, what kind of a defect has driven that asset into alarm? Is it a, an outer race defect, an inner race defect? What exactly is going on? Generate some pretty, pretty slick multimedia reports. We're able to bring in our charts. We're able to keep track of all of our historical data, screenshots of the spectrums. We're also able to bring in a sound file into these reports. So from a, an electronic report standpoint, you know, all the, the other user has to have when you email this report to somebody is Windows Media Player or some other way to play those sound files. They don't even have to have uh, DMS software. And they're able to not only see what the history tells them, see what the spectrum looks like, but they're able to listen to the sound file of that particular asset. So a lot of different reporting options. Um, and, and very powerful from a report generation standpoint. So why the forecast? Well, if you think about it, th there's a couple things that are, I think, really powerful with this new forecast 24-7 system. Uh, the heavy data storage is on board. You know, a lot of people we speak with are concerned about, you know, they don't want streaming data. They don't want to use up a lot of bandwidth, whether it's the the Wi-Fi in their plan or whether it's Ethernet. Um, so the heavy data storage on the forecast is all on board and you've got the flexibility to go get readings when you want or to send them over to your DMS for permanent record, you know, when they hit alarm levels. Uses an existing Ethernet network. If you're not able to do that, you certainly have the option to go with a, with a wireless system. Expands easily. So in other words, if we've got you know, assets that we're currently doing, you know, route-based handheld condition monitoring on, it, it's a real easy transition to just unplug the BNC and plug it into the forecast system because it uses those existing RAS sensors that you've already got installed. So why ultrasound? Easy deployment. I mean, it's, it's 
really quick, easy for us to get somebody up to speed with an ultrasound program, very short learning curve to become very proficient using this technology. Again, there's not uh, not a lot of tribal knowledge necessary. Um, you don't need a tremendous amount of experience to, to go out and look at you know, an increase in a decibel level means that things entered a low alarm or a higher higher increase in decibel level has entered a high alarm. Once you've got sound files to back up that data, um, the decision making is usually fairly simple. Um, with ultrasound, overall dB level is a great leading indicator. It's really high on the P to F curve. Um, it's an early warning. You know, if we look at you know some of the our customers that have vibration programs, phenomenal technology. We'll never knock it. It it really lets you dig down granular into uh, what kind of problems you're having and you know what's causing those problems. But just a just a high overall vibe level is usually too late. You know, once you've got a high vibe level, that asset's usually already you know in a failure mode. Whereas with ultrasound, it, it gives us a little earlier warning than that and, and helps us you know, make some good decisions while we've still got time left to implement those decisions. A lot of different things we can use it for, um, you know, especially on the lower RPM bearings. Uh, you get down into you know, 200 RPM, 300 RPM. You know, it can be done with, with vibration and with accelerometers, uh, but usually just requires longer data acquisition time. Um, you know, enveloping requires, you know, a, a lot more of, a, of high resolution. So with the ultrasound, it's, it's sort of quick, down and dirty and easy to get, uh, to get your readings on those lower RPM assets. And we can, we can expand the use of ultrasound into valves, uh, steam traps, you know, pretty much any mechanical um, asset is a, is a good place to use and apply ultrasound. We can look at the time data and the spectrum analysis data, you know, being able to pull that information over from permanent mounted sensors or being able to have that information available just off an SD card is really, really powerful. And uh, we've got some some simple solutions like our analog solutions, that's 750. You know, there's probably nothing better for uh, a pressure relief valve or for a, for an air handler up on a roof. Um, or we can get into, you know, a little more full functional permanent condition monitoring with something like the forecast system, which will let us really do some some detailed analysis and get a lot of really useful information for our, our root cause. So maybe we have the chance to avoid some of those problems in the future. So that's about... All I have, um, I'm going to pass this baton back to Maureen and let her wrap this up. Uh, certainly thank you, everyone, for your time this afternoon. Would love to talk to anybody about applications for any of our ultrasonic devices, especially these new permanent mounted systems. Um, and I guess we're open for a little bit of time for some questions, right, Maureen? Yeah, and... Um... Those of you that were asking some, I was trying to get back to some of you on some more specific questions. So, um, and there's a few that, you know, we've kind of already said we'll follow up with you guys offline. Um, but a couple questions that came in, you've touched on them a little bit since they were asked, but it probably some of these don't hurt to kind of touch on again. But quite a few questions coming through about kind of what goes into, you know, how much training is involved if you haven't used ultrasound before. Um, so kind of maybe talk again to sort of the whole idea of kind of what that learning curve on, on ultrasound is and how we, how, what we have that we can help folks, you know, get spun up on uh, the technology. We've got a whole bunch of different training options from, you know, I guess initially what we like to do when people first get you know, their, their handheld ultrasonic testers in, in plan is get one of our regional tech support guys out there and spend some time going through, you know, why they work, how they work, what they can do. Um, and, you know, usually get them up to speed enough that they can, they can start, they can, they can take the instrument out and they can start practicing with it. We've got some other more hands-on in-depth courses available like our, our two and a half day and four day implementation classes where we have an instructor come on site 
work with uh, work with the techs in the plant to go out and actually set up their routes, you know, take baseline readings, generally conduct things like an air survey and, you know, all, all kinds based on, on user need and application. We've got some online support available. Uh, anybody, and this applies to people who are just getting started or even some of you veterans out there who have used the technology. You know, we've rolled out our, our personal trainer program that lets people just simply call us and schedule to spend time on the phone with one of our trainers going through the software, you know, in a go-to meeting like this or, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And, and then we've got a, our, our certification courses that let people come and, and learn sort of soup to nuts on the uh, on the technology starts out to four, four to four to five day course. The fifth day really is just the certification exam. But uh, the four days is pretty intensive, you know, deep dive into the technology. It's, you know, understanding the theory behind ultrasound, understanding how the equipment works, what it can be used for. And then we go into things like, you know, procedures to do leak detection, procedures and, and how to analyze bearings and faults, condition-based lubrication, electrical inspection, and steam. So... I think we've pretty much got the whole gambit covered for, for those people that even have difficulty, you know, having someone come on site to do training or going to a, a, a certification course. We've even got online training available. So the, the online courses, we've got mechanical, electrical, leak detection and steam. Uh, people can sort of do those classes at their own pace. Typically what we find from when someone gets a hold of a, of a detector and you know with some ambition and some commitment they can be very proficient with this technology in three months you know with with some formalized training and with some practice uh, i'd feel confident in saying we could make somebody a pretty darn good ultrasound user in a, inside of three months hope that answers the question Perfect. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's there's quite a few more here. So for those of you that have that have uh, written in and asked some questions, um, we've taken note of all of these and we will um, follow up um, with you guys um, one on one um, so that we can be sure we're pretty specifically answering what it is that you're looking for. Um, but in the interest of time, because all of a sudden we are kind of up against it. I am going to uh, take the screen back from you, Doug, and uh, go through just a couple closing slides, and then we'll let everybody be on their way. And like I said, you know, we'll we'll get back in touch with those of you that that still had some questions that we didn't get to yet. Um, but just if you want to take note, you know, here's Doug's information, um, how you can reach him via email or or the phone. Um, obviously, you know, pretty much you should be able to even go on our website and, and it's pretty easy to find out how you can get in touch with us. Um, if you've got questions after the fact, um, definitely don't hesitate to, to reach out to any of us on the team and, and we'll be sure we get you to the right person to, to help you out. Um, did want to mention, you know, we do these webinars at least once a month. Um, next month we'll be doing three. Uh, we, I think this will be the fourth year we've done it. We, we turn uh, February into Lubruary, so we do all things the lubrication. Um, so we'll have three webinars next month. The first one is going to be next Wednesday, um, where Terry Harris, who's just a huge subject matter expert on, on anything lubrication related. He's going to be coming and talking to us about lubrication storage and consolidation best practices. So you'll see an invite going out for that tomorrow. Um, so hopefully you guys, if, if lubrication is something you're already doing and want to get better at or something you've been thinking about trying to get your arms around um he's just he's great does a great presentation um so so i hope you'll join us for that and then we'll we'll get some information out about the other webinars as well um, and since I did mention at the beginning, you know, we were recording this, um, it'll be up on our website and that goes for all the other webinars we do. So if there's a topic that's of interest to you or an application, most likely we've hit on it. Um, so you can go on our website and look in the on-demand education section and pretty much see all of all the uh, webinars that we've archived up there. Um, so, you know, use that as a resource too, as Doug was talking about with the training. We, we we try to have as many different types of resources um, available to help you all out on your, your journey here. Um, 
And then another great option is to uh, come on down to beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida in uh, May uh, for our conferences. We've got, this will be our 14th year. We've done our Ultrasound World Conference. So that's um, customers coming and sharing their um, stories of how they're using ultrasound at their facilities, the, the wins that they've had, the lessons learned. Um, it's a really cool opportunity to kind of learn from your peers, um, not from us just talking about it, but, but actually hearing from those, you know, the boots on the ground that are actually using this technology. Um, and that's co-located with our reliable asset world. So that side of things is, is a little more on kind of the, the bigger picture of reliability, condition monitoring, the other predictive technologies, um, uh, and uh, kind of more leadership topics and things like that. So you get the opportunity to, to attend sessions from, from both sides of the aisle there. Um, and uh, we hope that's something you can make some time for. Their websites are listed there. And of course, we'll get you more information if, if you're interested. Um, so with that, I will let you all head on your way. Um, thanks for spending some time with us. And uh, we'll look forward to being in touch with uh, a lot of you that, that had some pretty cool questions and some interest. So you'll look forward to hearing from us. And we'll hope to talk with uh, the rest of you all here soon. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Doug.